Dr. Graf, we can start. If you're ready, we're ready. But we cannot hear you. Yes. Ah, Hello, everyone. Hi, Alex, can you hear me? Perfect, yes, we can hear you. Yes. I can put my own laptop there to look to people as well. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me more? Well, yeah, you want to look at camera in it's on this one. See, you can look at Deze. Ja. Ja. You look fine. <laughs> you can just go on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hello, everyone. Alex, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Go ahead. I can't hear you now. Yes, just go ahead. We can hear you. Yes. Can you get when Alexander speaks? Can you hear him or your laptop? Alex. Alex, you're muted. Yes, we can hear you. You can just continue. Yes. But it's not um, room. Yes, thank you very much, Alex. And a warm welcome to everyone who's now tuning in from Utrecht, from the United States, from Australia, from Italy, from other places in Europe, um, from Britain. I see people from Britain tuning in and uh, very happy to have you all here. And thank you for joining us tonight at a conference towards a brave new world, rebuilding Europe after Napoleon, 1815, 1853. And uh, tonight is the beginning of our conference. And what we will be doing uh, is in a sequence that we will first have an introduction to the conference by me. And then we have an introduction by Eric Lund and Ozan Ozovci, whom I will introduce you shortly on the launch of the Security History Network. We have another very brief program issue by uh, the very newly minted Dr. Zach White, who only received his FIFA yesterday, if I'm correctly. And then the star of tonight's conference is Glenda Sluga, Professor Glenda Sluga, who will deliver the keynote. Um, and the welcome is on behalf of Alexander Mika Beretsen. He is visible over there, waving his hand. And uh, he is a professor at Louisiana State University in Shreveport. And please let me briefly show his book. His book is always under my computer because it's the best way of putting your computer up. So I always have it with me, Alex. You can always read in it as well. And uh, he is our co-host of tonight, together with Utrecht University and all the people that are around here. About the conference and what are, about the management of this conference as well, um, we decided that it's better for the management that you send in your questions via the chat and Alex will manage them 
today and i will be doing that tomorrow and you will be welcome to send in today and tomorrow all the things that you want to know um, we have also decided to mute all the microphones and uh, turn off the cameras only except for the speakers because of uh, the internet connection for tonight i would like to offer you drinks and refreshments um, but that's only visible and available for the people here in utrecht i hope that you have plenty of stock around your own place so that we can toast later on but now first of all why have we organized this conference why are we here well we are here because 200 years ago napoleon was finally defeated europe craved peace and stability after three decades of unprecedented revolutionary upheavals still the threat of revolutionary terror still loomed large in the minds of european political leaders and this particular period after 1815 and the decades after that was a very transformative period in time. It was about the shock and the horror of the past. It was about the expectations for the future, about a new coalition of victorious European states, new questions, how to deal with defeated nations, how to arrange for new security corporations and how to design the security in a way that it could mitigate the threat of war and terror. Mm -hmm. And with this conference, we like to build on recent historiographical works and explore how the European powers, societies in the years immediately after 1815, up until the Crimean War, transformed the norms of interstate relations, how they developed a new state system of collective security and laid the foundations for transnational police networks. And the theme of today's conference pivots around, I would say, two main questions. First question is, how did this transformation, this zattelt side, to use the term of Reinhard Kozelek, how can we tr start to understand it? Paul Schroeder, of course, with his pioneering work, but also Brian Vick, Glenda Sluga, who is with us tonight, they have compounded the importance of this moment for the international relations, but also for the design of new interstate systems and intrastate systems. So what happened exactly? Who pushed this transformation? Did it take place in the ballrooms, in the corridors of the finances? Did it take place uh, on the streets within police officers? Or did it take place also in the minds of the people, where the minds and the hearts of the people transformed? The second question is about the importance and relevance of broader cultural elements surrounding security. Again, with the Zettelt side, it's as much about past experiences as about hopes for the future, expectations, imaginations. So how was security imagined? How was this, this transformative moment between war and peace imagined, bridged? How did conflict and cooperation take place? And it was not just the institutions and the practices, it was also, as I said before, it was the mindsets, the culture, the ideas. It was not just the military and the diplomats, it was also all the other factors of societal life to which Glenda has contributed a lot as well. It was about police, intelligence, diplomacy, economics, the cultural life, intellectual history. So with this conference, we try to push that trend of historicizing the transformative moment of 1815 further and beyond by asking how, when, and why international relations, conflict, cooperation, and security emerged. And were those 1815 concepts of security, were they transformative in itself? in their governmentality, in the territoriality, in their centrality. Empirically, we will offer you a range of case studies, of new sources on imperial security, on big states, great powers, but also on the very tiny state of modest net tomorrow, on neutrality, on belligerence, and we will end the conference on Friday and Saturday with studying new patterns of policing, civil wars, um, fortresses, invasions, legal regi regimes, maritime and commercial security after 1850. And we will also try um, to be critical about this, to critically reflect on the possibilities and impossibilities of combining these variegated historiographies, because we're dealing here with cultural historians, international historians, diplomatic historians. There's so much out there that needs to be converged and we have to still see whether that's possible or not. So having said that, I would like to hand over to the two founding, amongst the two founding organizers of 
the Security History Network to introduce this new academic platform for research, dissemination, teaching, and public outreach. Let me introduce to you very briefly Dr. Ozan Ozavci and Dr. Eric De Lange. Ozan Ozavci and Eric uh, are both as assistant professors at Utrecht University. Ozan just published a seminal book, Dangerous Gifts, with Oxford University Press. And Eric De Lange defended his PhD thesis, Menacing Tides, about security in the Mediterranean last year. It's also under review and will be published later, hopefully this year. And um, they have a lot to share with you from Utrecht and from London. Eric and Ozem, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Beatrice. I think you need to. Uh, yes, I'll turn it Speaker, yeah. Can everyone hear me fine? Eric, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, well, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being us, uh, being with us uh, here today for the launch of the Security History Network. I'm going to briefly introduce what the network is or where the idea of the network comes from uh, in the next five minutes or so. So the Security History Network hatched about a year ago during a partial lockdown here in the Netherlands. It's another pandemic baby, conceived of this online, or to be more precise, at a wine table, when Beatrice, Eric, and I were talking about historians' life crisis. We found ourselves discussing a question one evening. I believe the network's bird is intrinsically linked to this question. As historians, when are we truly happy? Or can we ever truly and durably be happy while pursuing our profession, especially these days? Well, as much as it sounds like a drunk chat subject, there was a proper context to this question. So let me tell you first what that context was, and then I'll speak a bit about, more about why context matters for the Security History Network before leaving the floor to Eric. So that evening, the three of us were talking about this prominent historian friend of ours. I'll keep this person and their gender anonymous, so please prepare yourselves for a bit of jiggling with pronouns. I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room and on Zoom knows our friend, but I won't tell their name. They're a very well-known scholar whose books and articles are widely, and I'd say widely recognized, not only among the academics, but also by the general public. This person works at one of the best universities in the world with lavish resources at their disposal. And yet, it's about a year ago, the very same person was constantly complaining to one of us about how difficult their life has become lately, had become lately. That they feared their colleagues were finding them too old school, Eurocentric even, and that they were feeling more and more lonely. Even this person, even if they, at nearly the prime of their career, could feel like this, I thought at that wine table, slightly tipsy. Well, then what do we do? I asked at the wine table this question, when are we ever truly happy? Right now, Beatrice answered straight away. She was showing with her hand the table and each other to say, as it were, in the company of one another. Well, in fact, the three of us, Beatrice, Eric, and I have been working together for almost a decade now since 2014, when Beatrice was awarded a consolidator grant by the European Research Council, and Eric and I joined her for the project, Securing Europe, Fighting Its Enemies, the Making of a Security Culture in Europe and Beyond. Until the project ended in 2019, together with the rest of the ERC team that included Annalete Janse, Jups Henk, Konstantin Ardeleanu, and Walter Klem, we held meetings almost every, if not every other week. We discussed our work, our archival findings. We published blog posts about them. We gave each other feedback on the chapters of our books and articles, sometimes very blatantly 
honest feedback. And it proved to be a useful and very fruitful collaboration in the end, leading towards the publication of several important scholarly books, book chapters and articles that are listed on the network's website now. One of the main premises of the project was to consider security in historical context or to historicize it. Because on its own, when stripped from its immediate and larger discursive environment, security is a hollow concept. It gains meaning and traction in historical contingencies. And only the study of these contingencies permits us to comprehend whether we speak of an objective, a state of being, or an instrument, or a means to an end when we speak of security. These contingencies tell us whose security we are considering, who speaks authoritatively about security, and who remains silent or silenced, who pays for security. With these questions in mind, we've been researching and writing about security by embedding it into larger patterns or cultures, be it special in a given region or functional. So while historicizing security, we tend to consider it through a cultural lens. But this is one of the two main reasons as to why context matters to us, to the Security Eastern Network. Besides these methodological considerations, we value context and culture also in terms of our academic environment. I've written this elsewhere very recently. I'll repeat here. In recent years, academia in general and the humanities in particular have faced depressing budget cuts, heavy workloads, and a very challenging job market, especially for those at the start of their academic careers. But at the same time, studying the past and understanding the dynamics of human relations and especially security history have rarely been more important. Like some of the other projects the conveners of the network have already been involved in, with the Security History Network, we aim to foster or contribute to the fostering of shifts from a professional culture of winner takes it all rat race to a culture that places greater value on sharing expertise, sources, and skills, that recognizes everyone's contribution to the field in a welcoming, not exclusionary, academic setting. And with this hope, we intend to organize seminars and meetings on a regular basis to hear about each other's work and give each other feedback. To our website, we'd like to share our teaching and research like archival experiences and publish some of our findings in the shape of blogs before they turn into uh, publications in book article or book chapter form. We'd like to conduct podcast interviews with our current and prospective members to get to know more about their research and recent publications. And we hope to explore together opportunities to making inter-university and international funding applications with a view on creating new academic positions in our respective institutions. In short, we are inviting you to join forces in exploring aspects of security history from the long 19th century onwards together. We'd like to invite you all over to Utrecht and the Netherlands for our annual conferences and book talks. Our website is partly in the making, uh, but I must say, Brian Harris, who is sitting uh, here, and our support officer, Lena Harding, have done an excellent job in bringing together a large number of material together in, in such a short space of time and on a beautiful website, if I may be a little, a little bit biased. Eric is going to walk you through the website in a second. Especially our members page will shortly grow in a way that we will, we hope to have, a more diverse group of scholars and students of security history from different continents and backgrounds. So that's still in the making. But I'll end here thanking everyone for my part for participating in the launch of the network to our members and guests. I'd also like to emphasize that everyone is very welcome to join us, not only at our seminars and conferences like, like this, uh, these three days, you're most welcome to submit blog posts for our website. You're most welcome to share your ideas with us 
on how we can improve the network in the coming months and years. We cannot promise you, dear historians or, or colleagues from other disciplines, we cannot promise you the secrets of how to be truly and durably happy. That's a discussion for later. But every now and then, there will be wine and soft drinks, if you like, at our meetings and conferences in Utrecht or the Netherlands. There will also be the company of security historians eager to find out about your work and yourself. So please take a seat at our wine table. Please join us. Thank you for listening. Eric, the word is yours. Great, thank you, Ozan. Thank you all for being here as well. I will now try to share my screen, which even two years into the pandemic is always a bit of a tricky moment, but I hope it works now. Yes, I see thumbs up, excellent. So Ozan already gave a very um, picturesque um, historical reconstruction of how the SHN came into being. I could never um, do a better job than he just did. So thanks again. I will shift the perspective a little bit um, by first misquoting a 20th century US president, not only to show you my willful ignorance of contemporary history, but also to once again emphasize that this network is not only there for 19th century historians, but that we also extend the invitation to those working on more recent periods. So what I'll be talking about today is what the SHN can do for you. The SHN really is set up as a collaborative portal, a place where you can highlight your work um, and foster new connections with other scholars, uh, perhaps create new collaborative ventures. And I think there's no better way to do that than with a tour of our website, the securityhistorynetwork.com, which you can now um, reach if you type it into your browser. This website is a real treasure trove, um, expertly designed by Brian E. Harris and masterfully managed by Lena Harding. Once again, thanks for that as well. Um, because live website sharing can be a bit unstable, I've opted to make an old school PowerPoint out of this. So um, still a bit um, analog rather than fully digital, I would say. Okay. So here is um, the page of the securityhistorynetwork.com. Uh, this is its homepage. There's a slight Drosta effect going on here. Um, as you can see, the a launch featured very prominently in the carousel of news. Um, with this carousel features the main um, so your publications could be there, for instance, your blog posts um, or the events that you are organizing that you would like to showcase to our members. Um, these, oh, it's an unexpected animation. These are the features um, that are included on our website. Um, there's articles. Um, if you have published something new, you can highlight it here, bring it to everyone's attention. The same goes for books and books you may have published. There is the blog that I will be telling more about. Um, we have the members page um, where you can really showcase yourself. Um, and this doesn't even include everything yet. We are also planning to set up podcasts. You can see the interview section there um, in the bottom left as well. So perhaps the most important part of the network, as Ozon already said, is um, our membership, the, our, our very um, exciting and expanding group of members. So um, above, you can see the main conveners of this network, Beatrice Ozan, um, Annelotte Janssen, who represents the 20th century. She's a uh, PhD candidate at Utrecht University working on right-wing extremism um, after the Second World War, and myself. Below, you can see some of our other members. This is really where you can showcase yourself because if you click on these, um, links, you'll actually be sent to the institutional or private uh, uh, profile pages um, of the members. Um, continuing now to some of the more content uh, related stuff. This is what our blog page looks like. As you can see here, um, the latest blog published just this week um, is by myself. It's a, a small explanation um, of what the network is about and where that logo came from. Someone already compared it to a sort of Illuminati thing with that eye staring back at you. I can assure you it has nothing to do with that particular shady group. We're not trying to drag you into some kind of conspiracy. 
Um, but I won't spill the beans any further. Read the blog um, if you want to know more. These are some of the other blogs we have featured. Um, they're all arranged thematically. So there's stuff on Napoleon, um, on civil wars, on tourism. We have a maritime history section as well. And we would look forward to expanding those themes and topics even more and with the help of your input. This you can see here is the books and articles page. Uh, also part of the output, another place where you can showcase your work. Some of these um, book covers may be um, eerily familiar to some of you uh, because they are your own work. Um, what happens if you click on these is that you go to a page where you can see a short synopsis um, of the work in question and um, a link to the place where you can access or acquire it. The same goes for the articles that you can see on the bottom half of my screen right now. So that kind of uh, concludes my brief tour um, of our website. I hope I've given you some sort of inkling of what the SHN um, can do for you. Um, we do hope that all of you who are present here today and who are not yet members will feel very much welcomed to do so. Becoming a member is very easy. You go to the securityhistorynetwork.com website, you go to the members page and all the way at the bottom, there's this get in touch. There's this get in touch button, uh, which will direct you to um, a contact page where you can share your details. If you're a bit of a cautious person and you want to wait and see first, that's also fine. We totally respect that. Then I would invite you to join our newsletter so you can at least keep up to date with what is going on in SHN world, so to say. So thanks for uh, bearing with me on this little tour of the website. Um, I um, want to wish you all a very fruitful and enjoyable conference. We'll be speaking to some of you um, more. Um, so yeah, enjoy and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch soon. So thank you so, so very much, Eric and, and Ozan. Uh, indeed, I think you raised the level of happiness and mirth here in this room. Uh, so really, really nice and a great presentation. And I hope that many people will follow in your steps in, in looking up our website. Um, there may be a couple of questions now. I don't know if anyone put something in the chat. Alex, did you see questions for Ozan and Eric in the chat? Yes, uh, there are questions, but not pertinent. Sorry, I can't hear you. Per oh. Not pertinent to the history, so oh. the security oh. history network. So oh. I will ask them later. Yes, of course. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, there are questions, but they are not pertinent to the security history network. So we'll ask them later. Yeah. Okay, then um, I have one more program point because uh, before we move over to uh, Professor Glenn Sluga with a keynote, and uh, that is a program point that's also very dear to us and that also showcases that this network is a platform. It's not just an institutional platform and it's not just there for universities, it's also for activities in society. So I'm very proud to introduce to you Mr. Dr. Zach White. Um, he is a specialist on uh, crime and punishment within the British Army in the early 19th century. He defended this FIFA yesterday and he's still with us today, which is in itself, I think, a um, great effort. And he is here to introduce a societal in initiative that's very dear to me as well. Zach, you have the floor. And Alex, Zach, Zach can share his slides. Thank you. Is that coming across now? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beatrice, for that very warm introduction. Um, yeah, it's taking a little bit of use, getting used to uh, being introduced as, as Dr. White. Um, having spent many years as a teacher being called Mr. White, it's it's a it's an odd ring in the ear, but uh, it, it's one that I'm I'm relieved to have finally uh, achieved. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to your members about what I hope will be an equally exciting initiative as the one that we've already heard about this evening, the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity. In order to dig a little bit into this organization and what it seeks to achieve, I wonder if I could just ask folks to individually reflect on how do we and perhaps how should we treat the war dead and deceased veterans of all periods of history? That's not something that I'm necessarily expecting people to immediately answer, but 
I would encourage people to dwell on it as part of the wider work of this charity. These are integral players and participants in the security and in many cases the insecurity of nations. So there is a, a relevance to uh, this conference's themes. I think the reality uh, of how we treat the war dead changes depending on time and depending on the status of the individual, those at the top of society, your Napoleons, your Wellingtons, your Blukas, and so on throughout history, obviously receive their place in, in national places of remembrance, whether it's St Paul's Cathedral, whether it's the Eglise de Dome, and so on. But for those of a lesser, lesser status, the question is much more complex, and the story is very often one of neglect. I have three uh, images on the slide in front of you. The eagle-eyed amongst you may notice that the uh, central one is from La Dernier Quartier, just south of Waterloo, the site where Napoleon spent his last evening before the famous battle. In the grounds of that farmhouse, you will find this brick building. Uh, it is an ossuary. Uh, there is, of course, a long history of ossuaries on the European continent, but within this one are housed the remains of bones that are found up just by, dug up just by chance as a result of farming methods. They are housed in the ossuary. There is a wire mesh um, over the, the window that you can see uh, in the door. It is effectively open in, to the elements in that sense, um, and folks can go in and peer in. That's just one example of how folks have sought to remember the war dead. Now, whether or not you agree with that method is something of personal opinion. Others, of course, are remembered in different ways. Um, so, for example, on the left and the right, you have two, uh, well, the remains, I should say, of two graves um, of veterans of the Peninsula War and Waterloo campaigns. Uh, on the left is uh, Major General John Lacey. On the right is uh, Captain Severus Streatham. Both served in the British Army during this period. These are much more obvious stories of neglect. These are individuals who made it home, survived the war, went on to live hopefully very full and, full and, and happy lives afterwards. But their graves have fallen into disrepair. It has, of course, been nearly 200 years since their demise and the inevitable ravages of time have been wrought over those graves. But those are, of course, sites of remembrance. Um, if we think about a more modern example, modern of course being a relative term, and turn our minds to the wars of 1914 to 18 and 1939 to 45, of course we have much bigger sites of remembrance that are impeccably maintained in many cases by national institutions. There is nothing that predates 1914 in terms of an organisation that seeks to ensure that the war dead from other periods are remembered with the same level of dignity. Fundamentally, that is the aim of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity. Set up just last year, and I have to say I have the privilege of being the chair, uh, working with, a, uh, with partners across the world, Beatrice being one of them, I should say, we have two fundamental aims. The first, as you can see on your screen, is to advance the education for the public benefit about the lives and experiences of armed service and auxiliary forces who served at any point between 1775 and 1815. And this is a crucial element here, irrespective of nationality. The way in which we will do that is conducting our own research because the commemoration aspect is a fundamental aspect of what we are trying to do. But perhaps more centrally in terms of our name and our ethos, we seek to promote and support the maintenance and upkeep of graves, cemeteries and memorials commemorating the war dead and facilitating the burial, crucially, of human remains of members of the armed services and auxiliary services of all nationalities over the same period. What this amounts to is something that goes back to the origin story of this charity. A couple of years ago, I was working with a very good friend and colleague of mine, Professor Edward Koss from the United States Command and General Staff College. He and I were talking about the efforts that were made to study the remains of five individuals who were killed at the Siege of Burgos. Um, the, their nationalities are, in fact, a matter of debate. No research has been done to independently verify uh, their remains. Some seem to be British, others are perhaps French. Um, and it was a somewhat depressing story of huge scope for learning, 
of an incredible opportunity to not only enlighten ourselves about the lived experiences of these veterans, um, but also to create a lasting site of remembrance that ultimately fell through for simple want of money. Uh, Ed had the opportunity to involve the Smithsonian Institute in detailed analysis of these individuals' remains as a fundamental precursor to then ensuring that these individuals had their resting places marked for posterity. It was hugely frustrating to hear about how the project fell through. I sought to initiate my own version. And then of course the pandemic came to us all in 2019, which gave me reason to pause and think about the wider implications and come to this realization that this is un not a unique experience. And there are many such circumstances and, and similar situations around the world. It is worth saying that there is plenty of precedent for what we do. There are individuals out there who, though strapped for money, are doing what they can to restore graves to some semblance of order, whether that means the simple kinds of things that you can see on the screen in front of you, which is an example of what I did very recently at Southampton Old Common Cemetery. The black ring um, is what was visible of the grave that you can then see in the following two photographs. So there is um, certainly precedent for people going and restoring graves, but also for burial. Uh, very recently, there was a high profile incident of a French general, uh, Goudin, being buried at Les Invalides in Paris. So this is by no means an organization that is working uh, out on a limb. But it was very important that we made sure that this was done in an appropriate way, because individuals doing their best does not necessarily produce um, a collegiate and uh, wide ranging uh, series of opportunities for all stakeholders to have their say. There are many important and hugely valid perspectives. And we wanted this conversation about how various individuals are, are buried and, and their graves maintained to involve those from all um, perspectives on, on the professional um, continuum. So you have individuals like myself as academics, uh, Beatrice from Utrecht, uh, Ed Koss from the US. And, and as you go through this uh, sequence of individuals, you'll see that we have not only individuals from around the world, uh, from multiple continents, but also individuals who have vitally important perspectives, museum creators, archaeologists, um, obviously academics from the, the historical side of things, including military history experts, security history experts, but also heritage experts to enable us to look at the most appropriate ways to ensure that these graves are maintained in a way that is consistent and respectful. So that gives you a very quick run through of what we are and what we seek to do. We have many ambitious uh, aims and objectives. We have very recently launched a volunteer program encouraging people from around the world to help us to gather information about these sites and engage with their own local stories of remembrance by going into graveyards, locating the um, graves of veterans um, and using that as a way of connecting, but also then feeding that information back to us so that we can fundraise to ensure that the graves are restored um, and maintained appropriately going forwards. We will, of course, be fundraising for that. Uh, we are in an ongoing discussion with uh, a, a slightly glacial um, provider of, of accounts. Um, they will remain nameless. Um, but in the, the very near future, we are anticipating to formally launch our website and our membership program. Membership will cost £25 a year. I appreciate it. It's not an insignificant number, but it enables us to have regular kind of revenue in order to therefore be able to plan for the future. We will launch major fundraising efforts. The Burgos project that I mentioned is something that we will be embarking on in the very near future, working with our friends and colleagues out in Spain to achieve the aims of that original project that I talked about. We will be holding a conference at the National Army Museum in early September of this year. For more details on that and our other developments, uh, please do follow us on Twitter at NRWG Charity. You can see the details in the bottom right of the screen. If you'd be interested in joining our volunteer program or just knowing a little bit more about us, if you have any questions, please do get in touch. We understand that this is a contentious topic that people will have many perspectives on. Um, and equally, if you're willing to offer your thoughts and expertise, again, please do get in touch. The email address is in the bottom right, and I hope you'll forgive me for just uh, stating it aloud nrwgcharity at gmail.com. More than anything else though, I would urge you 
to simply engage in a discussion, speak to your colleagues, think, speak to other stakeholders, speak to others who will have a perspective on this issue. How should we and how do we treat the deceased, whether they be veterans or whether they be war dead uh, from conflicts across history? Can we establish some kind of consensus on how they should be treated? Because if we can, that would actually be perhaps the most valuable thing to come out of this project. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Zach, for that very heartfelt appeal, important appeal for historians, citizens alike, which gains even more salience in the current uh, news and events that we hear about how people, how societies deal with war graves and um, people fallen on the battlefield. So thank you for that. Um, now I'm very happy to take again the bridge over to an intellectual expose on this period by Professor Glenda Sluga. Glenda is here with us, uh, talking to us from Florence, if I'm not mistaken, not Australia, I think at the moment, which is better time-wise for you, Glenda. Uh, Glenda is a professor of international history and capitalism at the European University Institute in Florence. And her expertise ranges from Europe in the world, the 19th century, the 20th century, 21st century, globalization, Mediterranean history, the Greek revolution, as well as economic, cultural, and environmental history. Actually, I don't know if there's a field that you did not cover, perhaps aviation history, Glenda. Uh, in 2020, she was awarded European Research Council Advanced Grant, the highest grant there is, overseeing a huge research program on 20th century international economic thinking and the complex history of globalization. And uh, last year, she published this book, which could be considered very much also the Bible of this conference, the International Order, Remaking Europe After Napoleon. So we are so very proud and happy, Glenda, to have you here with us. And um, we're going to be glued to your lips and listen to what you can tell us about this period for the next 40 minutes. And again, I do invite people to send in questions or comments in the chat, and there will be ample room for discussion after your talk. Glenda, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Beatrice. You're always so generous. And I have to say that, um, you know, apart from wanting to thank you for the invitation, I also want to uh, celebrate the extraordinary influence you've had on so many people's lives. Um, all those young people developing networks and charities and, and it really is due to your generosity and, and mentoring. And the fact that you apply for these grants that give people jobs, fantastic. So, um, I also want to start by acknowledging the important critical contributions so many of you here have made to the history that we are in search of at this very timely conference. Uh, we're returning to the topic of peacemaking at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which has long been on the agenda of historians. And as Zach's um, uh, intervention just then reminds us, that is about people's lives and the loss of lives. And we're also concerned, I think, with understanding the changes that took place at the end of a quarter of a century of popular revolution and state-based violence across the European continent. So this was a time when a coalition of European empires and smaller states joined forces to defeat Napoleon in France and then convened a series of congresses and conferences to establish uh, relationships amongst themselves and determine the character of post-war Europe, of the possibilities for peace, uh, to discuss what constituted peace and what might even add up to a permanent peace. So I could imagine any one of the organizers of this conference standing up here addressing the themes that uh, we're tackling over the next few days, particularly given the uh, invention of this innovative security culture emphasis and return uh, amongst historians to this theme, a theme, of course, that IR people take up quite often. I'm looking forward to hearing all the papers. And in fact, uh, quite a lot of my work has relied on the work of people like Ozan and Eric, as well as, of course, Beatrice uh, uh, in the book and in uh, thinking about these questions since. We all study, you know, whether we think we're studying security cultures or not, 
we all study the peacemaking moments that in multiple ways air and enable the establishment of new or old security cultures. And I think one of the discussions we'll have is, you know, what we mean by security culture. I imagine we all see the importance of being able to orientate our studies of how and why objectives for peace, ideas of peace, and instruments of what we might call today peace building have been put in place, um, whether yesterday or 200 years ago, especially since this evening takes place against the background of the unconscionable war in Ukraine. And when public discussion is turning, I think increasingly and more urgently to how to bring it to an end and what peace will mean. So in these intersecting contexts, my talk is devoted um, to reflecting in a general way on what happened over the course of the half, half century that is the focus of this conference and why it might matter now. <clears throat> so I'm just going to share with you my um, PowerPoint. I think. Right, sorry. So can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. You see the rather um, cumbersome title I've given this paper. You'll see why in a minute. So my own work is focused on the invention of a modern international order that was constitutive of the rebuilding of Europe after Napoleon in its multiple, often paradoxical dimensions. And in fact, my conclusion is all paradoxes. You see why that matters. Of course, it's not much of a stretch to argue that the idea of an international order and security culture have much in common, especially if we consider the invention of an international order as the attempt to organize political authority in a specific way. This coincides with Mary Caldor's useful conceptualization of global security cultures as involving, in her words, different combinations of ideas, narratives, rules, people, tools, practices, and infrastructure embedded in a specific form of political authority, a set of power relations that come together to address or engage in large scale violence. On this definition, what defines the objectives and methods of a security culture is precisely what defined the ordering of relations between states at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And I find Mary Caldor's um, conception of global security cultures useful for rendering a pluralist understanding of security culture in the early 19th century. And I also want to take her template of, um, uh, of the idea of multiple global security cultures as, as part of what she describes as our contemporary experience, in contrast to the Cold War when she says, that there was one dominant culture based on military forces in nation states. So her four uh, security cultures are liberal peace, geopolitics, the war on terror, a new war. So that's now, right? So geopolitics is um, a security culture that foregrounds great power relations. New wars culture is one in which civil society and citizens become the targets of warfare. A liberal peace culture is um, one built on notions of humanitarianism and peace building. And war on terror is a culture of long range assassination and surveillance. Caldor also emphasizes the importance of identifying contradictions, dilemmas and experiments that might ultimately open up new pathways to rescue and safeguard civility in the future. So, I want to argue that her conceptualization of multiple security cultures useful, usefully maps onto the international order and, secure, and its security characteristics in the decades of the 19th century under consideration here. Not least because um, it captures, I think, the ambiguities and paradoxes intrinsic to the idea of the concept of Europe, which is the label often given to um, the form of or identification and characteristics of the 
the um, security culture. I think it's a really apt phrase in the concept, context of the concept of, of Europe, the security culture at the, at the specific moment of the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So um, I'm going to look at uh, the period of the conference framing, 1815 to 1853, when I want to argue there were multiple security cultures in gestation that were characteristically contradictory, experimental, and even paradoxical. And the reason why I think it's useful to do this is not for its own uh, sort of sake, but, um, but because um, I think it helps us understand why there's so little historical agreement on whether this period adds up to the reign of peace or in fact of ongoing conflict, whether it's a restoration uh, of a conservative European status quo or revolution in politics. Um, and I think uh, this notion of multiple and even paradoxical security cultures captures intrinsically the, um, the qualities of the liberal peace that are part of this uh, new uh, international order and the framing of its security culture. So I'm going to actually focus mainly on the liberal peace. I feel like I wish I'd written this paper with Beatrice because she could have, I would have given her war on terror <laughs> and new wars. Uh, I will also discuss geopolitics. So the liberal peace that uh, characterizes the uh, end of the Napoleonic Wars and the peace instituted then, the qualities of that were uh, its emphasis on constitutions, its emphasis on free trade and commerce, on new bureaucratic modern forms of diplomacy, on humanitarianism, which uh, of course uh, Mary uh, Calder also identifies in the context of the present. And also, uh, I think in terms of the early 19th century, the new actors incorporated into the processes of, um, of uh, international politics. And this includes uh, what I want, uh, women, which um, a group I won't talk about that much today, even though I will mention an individual woman, but uh, also more broadly, a European middle class. And in general, I'd argue that uh, constitutive of this liberal peace are uh, processes of ordering that are very much based around uh, gender, class, and civilization. And it's the civilizational aspect that I'm going to stress. I mean, in the context of uh, you know, intellectual community here, that I know knows a lot more about this topic uh, than I do. But I want to lay out some of the um, ideas I have about this civilizational ordering, uh, because I think it might be useful, in fact, to have a conversation about. Now, the ideal of a liberal peace, the idea that this period, 1815, or let's go earlier, in fact, 1814, the early phases of um, peacemaking at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, institutes a liberal peace, is firmly uh, associated with the work of Paul Schroeder and his study uh, from the 1990s of this period called The Transformation of European Politics. Schroeder's history of, the, um, of a longer period of coalition building uh, that leads uh, to the defeat of Napoleon, presents this period as key to the ideological transformation of European politics. And he argues that rather than pursuing peace as a form of defensive realpolitik to preserve the status quo out of fear of, of revolution, that the statesmen of the Vienna generation, of the Congress of Vienna, had learned from bitter experience that war was revolution. They had learned as well that something else even more fundamental to the existence of ordered society as they knew it was vulnerable and could be overthrown. The existence of any international order at all, the very possibility of their states coexisting as independent members of a European family of nations. So on this view, on Schroeder's view, the shared experience of war and coalition inspired transnational affinities. Uh, it meant the statesmen recognized the value of intermediary bodies, of concerts and group of concert and grouping methods. These methods encouraged an increasingly mainstream modern view of the possibility of a political equilibrium in international affairs without a geopolitical balance of power. It produced new imaginaries, not his word, but I'll put it in there, of international politics, but this is his phrase, restrained by consensus and bounded by law. So these methods 
of, build, of uh, inventing an international order, as I'd put it, or as you might put it, of inventing a security culture. Some of the language and concepts deployed by the um, coalition uh, to establish their cooperation were well rehearsed over at least a century of treaty documents. So it's not as if everything is new. Uh, the calls for a perpetual or permanent peace and equilibrium, the rest and well being of Europe, a solid and durable peace on earth and over the seas, the happy future of Europe, these were all uh, very much um, generic to uh, treaties for over a century. But the war bolstered the specific imperatives for concerting together on behalf of Europe. Among the allies, Russia, Britain, Prussia and Austria, the term concert evoked a policy of negotiation in deliberate contrast to Napoleon's rule by hegemony. And it became the source of the common identification of this period and group as a concert of Europe. I always felt that phrase was so ambiguous uh, uh, when I first got to know it. And I still feel that um, it, 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 its meaning is kind of intangible but I think it becomes very obvious as the century progresses that it is very much about a European definition of um, international politics and a civilizational ordering of Europe. So the first thing we'd note is that peace is an objective of the transformation of European politics and uh, of the, base of, um, the basis for uh, building relationships between Europe's major empires. The, secondly, the idea of a concert bolstering um, uh, is bolstered by the invention of shared modern transparent bureaucratic methods of diplomacy in which conferencing itself, right, concerting and conferencing in particular, rather than the turn to military means of resolving conflict is um, what is specific to this uh, particular moment. And here really we would be reading Beatrice de Graaf's recent work on uh, this period and uh, its importance uh, in terms of helping us understand how a new modern system of European collective security is seeded in this period. And Beatrice, of course, looks at the post-war settlement with a focus on new conferencing and cooperative institutions, such as the Allied Council and its many subcommittees, uh, and of course, uh, the ambassadorial uh, conferences later on, all of which she argues laid uh, the foundation of the military and financial integration of Europe in peacetime. Indeed, the research team that she uh, created as part of her ERC, Securing Europe and Beyond, has been able to show how these developments played out in other inter-allied and inter-imperial projects, whether on the Rhine, the Danube in Syria, or in the fight against pir piracy. And here, of course, uh, I turn to the work of Eric de Lange, as well as um, Ozan Ozachi, uh, his work, his book I've been reading uh, with great pleasure. Now, the other, other dimensions of this early 19th century liberal peace security culture was the introduction of a political social agenda to the idea of peace. And, and uh, you know, the discussions about how to enable and build a, um, a, a security culture, if you like, that reinforced a political and social agenda. And here, the language of and justification of humanitarianism, or more specifically humanity and philanthropy, was certainly important. Uh, and it's most evident in the, uh, in the organization of committees to deal with abolition, the abolition of uh, the slave trade, and in the constant return to the importance of, um, hum of humanitarian issues, uh, such as Jewish rights in the former French occupied areas, or in fact, uh, the kidnapping of Christians in the context of piracy, and eventually the protection of Orthodox Greeks in the Ottoman Empire. And we need to be sort of aware that this invocation of humanitarianism, of the, humani of the need to uh, act on behalf of humanity is of course the subject uh, at the moment of a very critical and important text by Sam Moyne on humane wars, uh, which really is about the 20th century, but I have to say, you want to think about how the, the, the humanity and humanitarianism is, is invoked in different ways through the 19th century. And I think the shift, the main shift we want to look at in this first half of the 19th century in the context of this conference and the building of security cultures is the shift from 
uh, a rationale that is focused on humanity in very secular context to one that is about humanity in a religious context. And that is uh, one of the significant shifts that under, underscores the civilizational ordering that goes on in the context of um, this new uh, liberal peace. Importantly, the story of how Europe comes to stand for the international in the security culture and how a handful of empires come to stand for Europe is a, a constant process of reinvention, just as the processes of ordering around gender and class and civilization are also a work in progress throughout these decades. Uh, which is why I think we need to pay lots of attention to the shifts that take place um, in uh, you know, this spate of 40 odd years. Most important, between 1815 and 1853, we also see a shift in the uh, rationale for um, uh, security, as I've argued, and this shift to um, an emphasis on religion. So what I want to do here, in fact, is to focus on the peacemaking that takes place after 1853, in 1856, uh, in, uh, that's the kind of iconic image of 18, uh, the 1815 peace. Um, when, because in 1856, uh, the end of the Crimean War that starts in 1853, which is the end point of this, for good reason, because in 1853, the, the outbreak of the Crimean War seems to bring an end, the, the, the um, decades of cooperation between um, European empires, as Russia, which had led the uh, peace settlement, the, the war against Napoleon, and then the peace settlement, and its liberal uh, conditions in 1814 now becomes the uh, belligerent and is the focus of um, a new coalition between Britain, uh, 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 France, and uh, to some extent Austria, defending the Ottoman Empire, an empire that isn't present in 1814 and 1815, partly because it chooses not to be incorporated into the, agree, uh, into the um, discussions for fear it will be swallowed up and the terms of its uh, incorporation would be determined by the, um, the European powers, something that uh, Ozan's book is now uh, you know, uh, de uh, detailing for us. Until um, 1825, in fact, uh, the Russian Tsar Alexander I refused to uh, resort to the principle of religious protection to intervene on behalf of Greek Orthodox in the Ottoman Empire, even though he could have used that to, uh, to realize Russian ambitions in the Crimean, because he believed that it would be interpreted by the other European empires as self-interested and a threat to um, their uh, commercial stakes in the Ottoman Empire, and it would unravel the, um, the bond between these European empires and Russia that had been established in the context of the war against Napoleon. So when does he change his mind and why? Well, it's not until 1825 on the eve of his death. And the reason uh, is complicated, but it's also due uh, as much as anything to the role of a woman, to a Baltic ambassadress, Dorothea Lievin, who finally convinces the Tsar to turn away from the multilateral principles of European confederation that characterize his post-war policy and to pursue instead the defense of Orthodox Greeks in the Ottoman Empire in Russia's unilateral interest. And Alexander dies not long after agreeing and his successor Tsar Nicholas I is much more inclined to act against the Ottoman Empire around the so-called Greek question. He has no vested interest in this relationship that the Tsar built up. In 1826, uh, as I've suggested, Lievin is instrumental in getting to the so-called uh, Protocol of St. Petersburg signed between Britain and Russia, uh, which goes against earlier trends of the Europeans after the Napoleonic Wars. It gets Britain intervening, despite the fact that Britain is now also, uh, its foreign minister has nothing to do with that generation that, um, uh, allied against Napoleon and then built the first peace. Uh, it's now George Canning. And uh, he agrees to intervene too. Um, and rationalizing the intervention 
uh, along with uh, Russia, as an act of invited mediation on principles of religion, justice, and humanity. They politely presume the Ottoman Empire's sovereignty cannot simply be usurped and that Greek autonomy, whether on the peninsula or in Ottoman Russian borderlands, does not require a national state, but they also insist that autonomous Greek regions um, will pay tribute to the Ottomans and gain in return complete liberty of conscience and entire freedom of commerce. So they add to the protocol a really novel condition that I think is marking a shift in the way in which um, not just religion, but uh, ethnic communities are being considered in this period. The territory in question in the, um, the, the borderline Ottoman uh, Russian territories will separate the individuals of the two nations by giving Greeks the right to purchase the property of Turks, whether situated on the continent of Greece or in the islands. A second agreement a year later for the pacification of Greece, as it's called, on the basis of sentiments of humanity and the tranquility of Europe, adds one more European signatory, France. And this time the Ottoman parties again have no say. The Treaty of London, which claims to be dealing with all the disorders of anarchy, not least uh, piracy that impedes the commerce in the states of Europe, tackles these problems by accent accentuating religious separation as the principle of Greek independence within the Ottoman Empire and by making Greeks the possessors of all Turkish property situated either upon the continent or in the islands of Greece. The three European powers warn that any rejection of these terms is to be met with the recognition of Greece de facto through the initiation of commercial relations and sending and receiving of consular agents. Of course, this escalates the tension between the Ottomans and the Russians. And, you know, eventually, um, with all sorts of skirmishes and, and actual um, you know, military conflicts, uh, and we don't get to the Crimean War until 1853, but I think this is a really important turning moment uh, in uh, the shift from the kinds of approach and thinking about liberal peace in 1814 to uh, liberal peace in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So I'm going to um, jump to 1856, but I, I, I just want to emphasize the tendency to um, what Mary Caldor might call a geopolitical security culture already appearing, whereby a handful of empires give themselves the authority to, to determine the security culture and exempt themselves from most of its principles. Uh, secondly, to underscore the civilizational ordering that is intrinsic to uh, the conceptualization of this security culture and its liberal conditions not least by eradicating any ambiguity around the religious basis of its humanitarian impulse. So I want to now look at 1856. Now in this picture, I can't see because I've got my little people, but you can see um, there's, in contrast to the early iconic depiction of uh, the Congress of Vienna and the gentleman sitting around in a room, of course, that wasn't ever a real meeting, but in this one, we have a Turkish figure uh, wearing a fez. The diplomacy that ends the Crimean War at the 1856 Congress of Paris is an attempt by Europe's main imperial powers to pick up where the Congress of Vienna left off. So it allows us to compare 40 years later what went on. For the victorious French Emperor Napoleon III, the comparison with 1814 is everywhere and it's personal. It's intended to rewrite the history of Napoleon's defeat and French destiny rather than emphasize European solidarity. It revels in France's moral and military victory over Russia the as the unambiguous villain of the peace. Uh, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon III has invested substantially in a state enhancing new diplomacy by building a sumptuous Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Quai d'Orsay, which is the Congress stage. Uh, and this is meant to make a statement about the substantial modernity of France's state bureaucracy as well. The Congress of Paris presents the continuation of the paradoxes of the concept of Europe. And in a sense, it shows that the his this history doesn't just go forward. It pursues an ancien uh, aristocratic form of sociability. Uh, apparently, the Congress dances better than the Vienna Congress. This is one of the themes of the uh, journalism. And it gets mingled with more modern legal institutional forms of diplomatic practice and political convention that are conceded in that earlier 1814 moment. 
over the less than two months of the Paris Congress that begins in late February. 24 meetings are held at the Quai d'Orsay and there are no commissions of experts as in 1814, only five general sessions. The Ottoman Empire is there, unlike in 1814, when uh, it chose to watch from the sidelines, and it's represented by Mehmed Emin Ali Pasha, the empire's secular reformist foreign minister. Russia uh, has uh, Prince Orlov and Baron Brunov, and Britain sends its ambassador to France, Lord Cowley, a nephew of the Duke of Wellington, who featured in the uh, earlier uh, moment. As with previous congresses, the public has a role through the pre presence of the expanding press and the role of non-state actors. In 1856, as in 1814, this limited public navigates the diplomacy of peacemaking through its avenues of sociability and networking, allowing non-state actors to exert some influence on the concerns of the Congress agenda. There are three members of the English Peace Society, founded in 1816 in London by the Quakers, which the Tsar, uh, Tsar Alexander had so admired, and they attend now in order to lobby the Congress diplomats to consider the importance of arbitration as a method of preventing war. The result is that the Congress agrees to express a wish that mediation might be used as the first port of call when disagreement occurred, occurs amongst um, treaty partners, that states in conflict should appeal to the good offices of a friendly power before resort to force. And of course, this is a theme that gets picked up more and more uh, through the 19th century. So at the same time as this kind of more liberal, very fam quite familiar liberal culture of arbitration and laws is, uh, rules uh, is being formulated, uh, the geopolitics version of the security culture is also in place. Ottoman historians, um, not least uh, you know, Mustafa Minawi and Emre Oktem, have remarked that what mattered in the making of the 1856 peace are the interests of the ruling classes of France and Britain and not the Ottomans. The great powers tried to find solutions with little reference to the port, they argue. While visual records of peacemaking diplomacy now include a Turkish figure wearing the characteristic fez and legal documents refer to the Ottoman Sultan as his majesty, a titular elevation, uh, elevation, integration is more complicated. Article seven of the Treaty of Paris explicitly states that Istanbul can partake in the advantages of European public law. But before that is decided, the European powers legalize their interference in the Ottoman state at a preemptive side secret conference held in January 1856 before the Paris conference. And this is where the fate of the Ottoman Empire and to some extent Russia is decided. So the Ottoman Empire goes from being imagined in the early 19th century as the seventh power of Europe in the ancien system of diplomatic relations to being in fact treated more like the vanquished power alongside Russia as Britain and France draw up a parallel European legal system, which in turn redraws the boundaries of, the Ottoman, of Ottoman sovereignty on the international stage. The principle of free navigation, which is one of the liberal principles uh, of the peace in 1814 and 15, the principle of free ships and free goods, which is previously introduced under the rubric of cultivating peaceful relations between neighboring states, is now used to open up the Danube, a river that connects European and Ottoman trade routes to European powers. And it's put under the control of the European Commission of the Danube and removes Russia from a position of control at the river's mouth. The European empires declare the Black Sea neutral and the Turkish Straits closed to warships and they take away from Russia and the Ottoman Empire their right to have a navy in the Black Sea. The new regulations subject the Ottoman Empire's sovereign rights in the Black Sea to unilateral conditions favoring the European allies. At this secret continental conference, the Europeans openly pursue their attack on Ottoman sovereignty as a question of religion. They agree amongst themselves, firstly, to repeal um, an earlier uh, 18th century treaty, which had given Russia the duty of care of Greek Orthodox subjects of the Ottoman Empire, and they blame the, um, the fact that uh, Russia had misinterpreted its rights. They do not remove the existing principle of Christian duty of care, they just take it for themselves. The Europeans add a requirement that their Ottoman allies must allow conversion to Christianity within the empire, thereby opening the floodgates to Christian missionary activity in the predominantly Muslim realm. 
They act as if the Ottoman Empire has not previously attempted its own reforms, improving the Christian status, or that Christian groups were not complicit in fomenting dissension by rejecting those reforms precisely in order to be able to call upon the protection of foreign powers. Instead, the Ottoman state's unequal status has now been reinvented through a regime of commercial relations and so-called capitulations that bestow privileges on Christians and the European empires. Some of the steps taken by the Europeans look to the international future. Um, this includes a timid attempt to codify a law for the prevention of war and uh, the Danube Commission, which becomes part of you know, histories of liberal international order. Their declaration of maritime law is presented as adding to the high flying sentiments embodied in the earlier 1814 uh, engagement of, slave, of abolition of the slave trade and freedom of navigation as codifying the first general agreement about naval war valid even beyond the jurisdiction of European international law in the name of the spirit of the century and the progress of civilization. Their practical focus is less idealistic, however, and more realistic, namely preventing the seizure of either enemy goods under neutral flags or neutral goods under enemy flags and reducing the strategic use of blockades because of their impact on free ships and free goods. So the consequences of these laws and precedents are important to note. Within a few years, this new legal infrastructure will enable the French to exercise a droit d'intervention in Ottoman Lebanon and Syria on humanitarian grounds. At the end of the First World War, the logic of the separation of religious communities introduced already in 1827 will become a mainstay of the arsenal of peacemaking culminating in the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne. So the concept of Europe's simultaneously universal and Christian moral agenda came, I think, with a long list of um, exemptions and paradoxes and ambiguities that suited their imperial state and overlapping religious interests. And these are much more ambiguous and uncertain in the 1814 period than they are by the mid 19th century. The idea that the economic and political ambitions of a few European imperial governments were being foisted upon the world for better or worse, was not uncommon in the early 19th century. And, uh, you know, if we're talking about geopolitical world orders and security cultures, then, you know, the similarity, similarities between that and the UN Security Council need to be acknowledged. The civilizational implications of this new order um, reached beyond Europeans, Europe's borders. And I think, you know, it was as significant um, in civilizational terms for Russia as the Ottoman Empire, because you already have in, an inkling of the unease of the place of Russia in this European uh, security culture in 1814 and 1815. You know, listening to the ways in which the foreign ministers talk amongst themselves, Metnik would uh, constantly evoke um, uh, 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 the Tsar as unreliable because he spoke with women or uh, argued that he would, you know, he felt threatened by him in, in homosexual ways. So the Tsar's place in this, in the picture of a liberal peace and European alliance is always problematic, despite the fact that Tsar Alexander is, of course, the one that speaks the longest and, and most ardently to the, um, the idea of this uh, more inclusive sort of concert of Europe uh, project. Uh, but I think we also have to consider the ways in which the, the status of the Ottoman Empire diminishes uh, from the uh, early 19th century uh, through the um, to the mid uh, 19th around these issues of the of the building of uh, what we would call in this context a, a security culture. So the history of the invention of an international order, as I've I think about it, certainly involved what other historians have described as the deglobalization of world politics, in the sense that between 1814 and 1856, it involved the drawing of tighter borders within and around Europe as an idea uh, uh, with rules that did not apply to its major imperial powers. The Ottoman Empire became a state that occupied an unstable position on the continuum of late 19th century European um, inter-imperial system of sovereignty. Oscillating, uh, this is actually, I think, Manawi's words, oscillating between a subject and an object of new forms of imperialism. So while in theory, the sublime port now is a member of the revised concert, in practice, it becomes more like a European protectorate. 
Uh, so again, I mean, if I had more time, it would be interesting to talk about how these other categories of uh, security culture, uh, the war on terror, uh, new wars might translate across uh, back into the 19th century, although we might want to also devise other uh, um, categories to understand the complexity and paradoxes of intrinsic to the um, invention of international order and, and the idea of security culture and whether one thinks of security culture as above international order or below or complementary is also uh, interesting. And uh, I don't have an answer to that, but it would be useful to discuss it. By the mid 19th century, uh, the principles of a Europe led security culture with peace as its objective uh, was still connected to the innovations in ideas and practices introduced at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. But, you know, importantly, I think we see the processes of reinvention and um, uh, that were taking place and repurposing, if you like, of these ideas. And I think uh, for me, what's important uh, in, in having this discussion is to think about what's at stake uh, for how we understand the present. It's, I don't wanna be presentist, but I do think when we are discussing these issues, we can't not think about the present, about, um, uh, not only you know, thinking about the multiple paradoxical security cultures that can constitute the present, but the changing capacities of and for politics that they involved, for imagining the point of politics between states. Uh, the legacy of this history is both about the possibilities and limitations of the inherited past. Uh, and I want to um, end by, with two examples of what I mean by that. Well, you can take it in any direction. The first two come from 2014. And um, I think they both uh, uh, underscore the opportunity that's available in paradox and the narr and narratives of 1814 and the idea of a liberal peace. In March 2014, Angela Merkel, uh, who was then the German Chancellor and otherwise thought of as the Chancellor of Europe, revoked what she argued was a 19th century tradition of spheres of influence in favor of a global perspective on foreign policy. So she doesn't think of the 19th century as uh, tied to any kind of liberal uh, peace. It's a spheres of influence world. So, and speaking to the centenary at the time of the First World War, she argued about, she argued that the relative years of peace on the continent was down to European integration in the, in the second half of the 20th century. And she included Russia in this, uh, and she argued it was thanks to a web of interconnection based on treaties and agreements encompassing trade and broader topics that Europe had been able to build peace. By contrast, she said Russia's role in the Crimea was evidence of the law of the strong being pitted against the strength of the law and one-sided geopolitical interests being placed ahead of efforts to reach agreement and cooperation. So she believed that the 19th and 20th, at the 19th century, in fact, a lot of the 20th century were really just about geopolitics, so geopolitical security cultures, and that that was what uh, was being drawn on, that model was being drawn on in uh, Russia's role in the Crimean, while her own policy was of, pol of political and diplomatic efforts, not the resort to military means to deal with um, uh, the issues that Russia had with Ukraine. Meanwhile, ironically, that same year, Putin was himself engaging in some serious ambiguity and drawing on the liberal peace notion of the uh, first half of the uh, 19th century, unveiling a monument to the Russian Tsar in November uh, 2014 to Alexander I uh, at the Moscow Kremlin. He pointed out that Alexander I had played a considerable role in uniting Russians and in defending steadfastly the country's in independence. Uh, this is Putin. Alexander I entered, the, he entered history as Napoleon's conqueror, as a forward-looking strategist and diplomat as a statesman who shouldered responsibility for the security development of Europe and the whole world. It was the Russian emperor who was a father of the then system of European and international security, which was quite adequate to the times. Uh, he said, adding that then a balance was set up on the basis of mutual respect for countries' interests as well as of moral values. The Russian president recalled Russia's stance toward France's sovereignty at the time. It is worth mentioning, he said, how respectfully and noble-minded Russia the winner country treated France's sovereignty and national, dignity, and national dignity. So in fact, he was invoking the liberal peace idea of um, ideals of that earlier period. 
And the last um, examples I want to draw on are a bit more uh, contemporary. I've been thinking about how, you know, um, the discussion about uh, how wars end and what the significance of the Ukraine war is for thinking about uh, security, European security order or the point of security cultures. And um, I found uh, in particular disturbing a piece that Anne Applebaum published in The Atlantic, which talked, to, which argued there was no liberal world order. And on that basis, uh, the democracies had to in fact, not just have arms, but use them. Uh, problematic because it, imagine the democracy never use their arms, it forgot Hiroshima, it forgot what NATO was, uh, all about um, and ignored you know, the nuclear question. But I think um, really interestingly uh, that um, Sam Moyne has come out, and I think this is in the context of this quite shifting position on, on uh, how one thinks about um, in, uh, you know, the politics of international uh, in the modern period. And he's come out in, the, um, uh, in a new piece, uh, and I just can't remember which journal it's in, but he's arguing that the significance um, of uh, the war in Ukraine and the discussion we're having, the debate, is that it, it calls us to imagine a less hypocritical international order, so a less geopolitical one, and to think about what it would mean to construct an internationalism that prohibits violence across the board, so that it returns us to a, to a discourse of peace as the objective of security cultures that deals with the agonizing challenge of building more genuine democracies at home, rather than reverting to polarities that see security in terms of a fight for democracies already worthy of the name. So I think I, I see in these uh, different um, stories, uh, a sense of what's at stake in this uh, particular moment and in the history of the early 19th century. And I really look forward to hearing all your papers over the next few days and to thinking about these questions in the context of what we learn from you about uh, the complexities, uh, the multiple security cultures and the paradoxical um, uh, outcomes of uh, the first half of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Glenda, for this very rich and very broad and deep talk on uh, liberal peace, transformation of uh, international order, and uh, even ending with a view on the current war in Ukraine and uh, whether this order is now breaking apart under our fingers. I do have a lot of questions for you, Glenda, and I'm going to start with first a very straightforward question to take it on lightly. Um, the first one is, what kind of sources do historians depend on to ascertain people's opinion, given the absence of credible opinion polls in the 19th century? And one may add, given the absence of credible opinion polls in the 21st century in Russia right now. But this question is still in the early 19th century. So what would be your answer to that, Glenda? And so I think what so you're you're thinking about how we understand um, you know where we locate these discourses, right? Is that your view? So I would, if I say that um, these are the values of the security cultures of the early nineteenth century, where are they located? And um, so you, as you know, Beatrice, I think both of us have been uh, engaged with uh, moving outside of the realm of um, you know a small group of statesmen, which was the focus of historians such as Paul Schroeder, you know, very important work. But actually, I think we know more about them when we situate them in their relationships uh, with other people and also in the context of what other uh, people are thinking. And in that, uh, with that in mind, um, you know, I think that uh, it's the Republic of Letters. So even if we, even if we don't have uh, the sorts of sources we might have today, we have much better ones because in the Republic of Letters, everybody was writing. And also they were all keeping memoirs. Now, all doesn't mean everybody, uh, but in those letters and memoirs, there's also observations about broader publics. But it does, it seems to me that there is a broader um, co uh, contingent of people that include um, not just inner circles or exceptional women uh, and men, such as I, uh, I've also focused on, but um, 
broader communities of people writing to each other, engaging this politics of a, you know, a, a rising middle class in particular that um, comes to petition the conferences to have their say on what should be part of the agenda of this um, of these moments of uh, peacemaking, and and the the richness of the politics, uh, the fact that there is this investment in the politics between states is part of what I'm really interested in, and why I think it, it's it's important to remember this period. Not um, you know Merkel might say it's just spheres of influence, and in fact that became a very popular view of uh, of this period in the um, during the First World War. Wilson, you know, uh, in making his speech to the Congress, uh, the American Congress, to uh, join in the war effort, argues that the point of joining in is to make sure that it's not going to be like the past, that they're going to do, you know, it's going to be much more uh, 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 inclusive and democratic peace. But in fact, you know, that's rewriting what happens in the earlier period. And I do think there's that studying the early 19th century is a, a useful reminder of just you know, how long there's been this broad public engagement with the politics between states and the processes of what you would call security culture making, and I would just call kind of invention of international order, and people could call different things, but I think we mean very simple, similar things since, you know, the objective of peace and the uh, debate about what constitutes peace and how you get it is intrinsic. You can't have peace unless you get rid of the slave trade, or in the 20th century, you can't have peace unless you get rid of the colour line. So these are all you know, arguments about how broad um, the, uh, the, the, the tackling of peace has to be or how deep it has to go in order for it to be um, effective in any way, to have, have um, a serious uh, kind of peace culture, if you like, as much as security culture. Thank you, Glenda. And um, if I may follow up on that response, there's another question. So the questions that I read aloud are not my questions, but they came in uh, via the chat master, which is Alex. Um, I'm of course not sure whether he invented all the questions or whether they are from other people as well, but I do think this is not one that Alex invented. Um, that's the question which, which does require some imagination and the stretching of 200 years. To what extent does the Congress of Vienna still shape today's world? Does it have any effect at all after 200 years? So what do you say? Could we have a, could we have, could we have a collective effort on answering that? <laughs> what would you say, Beatrice? I think, you go first, Glenda. I don't think, I think it's, you know, it's not so much the Congress of Vienna, but the whole process is that that Congress is part of. So I would argue that the ordering that begins to take place there you know, is part of a trajectory that it, while the, the narrative of the Congress keeps getting utilized and drawn upon, so that's still with us, you know, 2014, 2022, but the actual, some of the structural institutional shifts are, you know, the investment in diplomacy. I mean, sometimes they're forgotten, but they're there in terms of the, uh, the, the effort and investment that goes into building um, cultures of diplomacy and ministries, uh, foreign ministries that, you know, that uh, uh, educate diplomats and train diplomats and send them out into the world uh, and put more emphasis on arbitration. The legal system we have, the emphasis on, on legal arbitration, on what was called European public law in this early uh, 19th century period and we now call international law. And I think we always have to be attentive to the ways in which you know, the European comes to stand in for the international in a lot of these um, in developments. And, in, and of course, it's one of the reasons why you know, in the Post Second World War period, particularly from the 1960s onwards, there were these challenges to how this the hierarchies had been uh, structurally uh, uh, embedded in uh, the international order. Whether or not in the security culture, there's a different question, and whether nations had more to do with uh, building security cultures than the international is another question by the time we get to the 20th century. Yes, and if I may add indeed a, a couple of personal uh, reflections to that. Um, there was a discussion in, in the Netherlands in social media and in the newspapers recently to which I also contributed. It was not even me who suggested it, but other experts and historians who said what we need now vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine and Russia is a kind of a new Vienna Congress, including Russia. And then many people reacted and responded quite uh, uh, outraged and saying, well, this was one of the worst international orders. It was repressive. It didn't bring freedom at all. It only led to new revolutions and uprisings. So from the Dutch perspective, 
obviously in 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 that 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 societal context vienna congress um means repression authoritarianism holy alliance and it's that's still very much the kind of dark myth about that congress and if you then try to explain what you just did that it indeed did impact and did inform our current diplomatic practices, the conferencing, uh, the, the way of treating states on the alphabetical order, um, the, the diplomatic ranks, um, uh, all those things, the embassies, that that still hasn't made much inroads. And tying that to another question, Glenda, if I may, and that's a question, uh, I think, one from Alex himself, um, you discussed the notion of liberal peace. And as we just said, Vienna Congress has had an impact, but it's also considered very much of an illiberal piece. So if you discuss the Vienna Congress, these people that had a great eye to security, to peace, to progress, they had, and you demonstrated that, they still paid so little regard to minorities, to societies, to later on to socialism. So what does that teach us? And make to make it even more complex if we just discuss today's liberal order uh, are don't we have today the same blind spots are aren't we today with all our liberal minded workings towards international order not in the same way repressive hierarchical imperialist what do you think well i mean i'd go back to the paradoxes right and that inside those paradoxes you get uh the, you know both the possibilities of uh progressive, more uh, inclusive, more radical ideas about um, the point of international order or security cultures, and you also get its limitations. So, and you can, there are different narratives you can pick up, right? So one is, the really important one for me is the extent, as I said before, the extent of political engagement and efforts. Even if you think about the uh, peace societies petitioning in, um, 1856, or you know the earlier anti-slave um, trade movement and its in, impact in 1814 and 1815. So you know all of these moments uh, enable things that weren't possible before because they, a bit like you know the rules-based order now, or even the UN, right? It has a security culture, a uh, security council, which is about hierarchy and about you know the you know great powers grabbing, uh, uh, taking authority for themselves and, and claiming exemption from many of the rules that they oversee. But at the same time, you have a general assembly, right, that has empowered and given uh, incredible space to, you know, the global south, but also to, you know, feminism, and has been able to shift the discourse and to uh, empower all sorts of um, causes we couldn't have imagined before. Everything is a work in progress. And I think the idea that you can have some absolute, you know, utopia is not something that many of the, any of the people that have been engaged in trying to think about how to fix, you know, these, these um, how to utilise moments of crisis and build new uh, international orders, invent new international orders, have thought about uh, what can happen. Um, I actually think that it is, you know, interesting to go... Think about not only 1814, but also um, uh, maybe 1856, I don't know. I'd have to think more about that, but definitely 1919 and 1945 as moments when um, the importance of them is the extent to which, you know, the politics uh, involved draws in bigger communities of people, canvases um, all sorts of problems and, in, and allows for a range of voices. In 1814, uh, in 1919, in 1945, and there's windows of opportunity. Uh, they get closed down very quickly. Um, you know, powers end up exploiting um, all sorts of rules that aren't meant to enable their, uh, you know, more imperial uh, ambitions, for example. But uh, that's the issue is how do you build an international order that um, is at this moment, like in those other moments, extraordinary for how it pushes forward and invents completely new possibilities that weren't imaginable imagined before so how do you do take this moment and do the same sort of thing and i think that's what sam was talking about and certainly what i think um, we should be discussing now how to set agendas 
Yes, and, and, and if we discuss those agendas and if we discuss inclusivity and people that take part in, in the Congress and the conference and take part in shaping that order, there's another very important question, I think, going back to the 19th century. It's coming from Ozan, who's sitting here next to me, but I still read it uh, up due to uh, te technicalities. Um, judging from European sources in 1856, what you did for your book, do you think that the Ottoman Empire was considered a part of the concept of Europe on an equal basis with the Treaty of Paris? And did participating in the privileges of the concept mean the recognition of the Ottoman Empire as a great power? So how inclusive was this European peace order at the time? Uh, so in 1856, well, I'd go back to what I said, and it's not me, you know, I think drawing on, um, on the work that's out there by Ottoman scholars, uh, you know, you have got that visual incorporation, but I, you know, in the context of um, a very geopolitical move of making sure that the Ottoman Empire uh, does not have an equal say, even though it's, you know, a, a victor um, empire. So it's the British and the French that dictate the terms of the peace and very much um, utilize the moment to make sure that their commercial interests in those regions uh, uh, protected, but also expanded uh, at the at the at the um, cost of the of both the Ottoman and the Russian empires. So it's as if the Russian and the Ottomans are in the same basket. So it's not just me, and I think it's Manawi. He talks about the status. So you know there are all the all these bits and pieces that are evidence of having some kind of uh, being included in the empire, and in fact, or in this new order, they are also included if you think about it through the fact that they are in. It, is so indebted in this new sovereign debt culture in the context of the war, they become incorporated in this new um, international order by virtue of their indebtedness, uh, you know, fiscal indebtedness um, to um, uh, European banks. Uh, at the, uh, something that is also part, as you've, you've written about um, as well, Beatrice, that is part of the, the, the kinds of international order being established, the, the, the new kinds of international finance that are part of this you know, diplomatic um, political moment. Um, the, the Ottoman Empire is, you know, if you take a Manawi, it has the status of a protectorate state uh, as part of a, now incorporated into the European order. Whereas the ambiguity of its position in 1814, I'd argue, but again, I also, um, you know, give way to your view on this because, uh, as I, because you're the you're the Ottoman scholar in the room. But uh, my view would be that in the 1814 context, as you've written about, I think. The, um, you know, there's a much more careful negotiation of their status and not wanting to be drawn in as a way of making sure they're not disempowered by virtue of being drawn in uh, and around questions, again, of commercial arrangements already in 1814 and 15. But, you know, maybe Ozan should say something because I think this is an important part of this history. Yeah, it's 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 a bit difficult for now. He's sitting here next to me, and uh, during the conference, very keen on saying something. But that's probably uh, we better do that tomorrow for the panel. It gives us a little bit more room. But you're so very right in raising these issues, and it's not so much me who investigate. It's Ozan who, who wrote a whole book about this, about the hierarchies, the implicit hierarchies involved in this peace order, and that's always the problem if you deal with peace orders and, and states. The states are not alike; they have different power uh, continuums and and also different perceptions on the way to measure and assess that power. Um, who is there to decide who is a great power or not? And we see that happening with, with Russia today. It considers itself a great power, whereas from the European perspective, all countries are equal. And self-determination is uh, the building brick and the paradigm of international order. So that's not just measuring uh, which power is, is heavier in terms of hierarchies. It's also the, 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 the way of assessing this and applying which principle uh, is there to decide on the relative power of, of, of a country. And what we see happening today is not so much the unraveling of an order, I would say, because it's still very much enshrined and institutionalized, but it's a different way of perceiving and assessing and dealing and arranging with these orders um, uh, that, that, that is so challenged uh, by the war itself, of course. So I think for now, um, we're going to wrap it up. We discussed a lot and you set the bar very high, Glenda. You raised the international order, 
uh, the, the, the relations between states, the role of diplomats, you mentioned the women. I really love that you showed Dorothea Lievin. You know that I, I love her as well. And um, I don't you know didn't if I love talk her. <laughs> very much about economics, but we can we can make up for that tomorrow. Joop Schenk will be there tomorrow on Saturday and he will deal with commerce and uh, economic security as well. We have a very interesting program following up on the things that you discussed. We will discuss the Dancing Congress, we will discuss Hegel and the idea of constitutionalism. We have Matthijs Locke, you talked about liberal peace, uh, Glenda, but there is also a conservative peace and it's very much, a, of course, a, a discussion whether this peace of 1815 wasn't far more a conservative one than a liberal one. Then we have Ireland, we have Morris Nett, and of course our keynote speaker, uh, Elise Wirtschafter, who has a very important story to share with us as well. So I hope I hope you can be with us tomorrow, uh, at least a little bit online, Glenda. And um, mm -hmm. for now, I would like to thank you a lot. We will drink to your health afterwards here with the people in Utrecht. Oh, yeah, I'm in Utrecht. Keep wine in Florence <laughs> even better. And uh, we all in, wine in the US or wherever everyone is, is, is tuning into is good as well. I also would like to thank explicitly again, Lena Harding, Mitte van Groningen, Annelotte Janssen, uh, Eric De Lange, Ozan Ozafci, Zach White, who've all been here having helped in organizing the whole conference and participating tonight. But above all, a heartfelt applause for you, Glenda. Thank you all. People are now joining me in, an, in a storming applause. You just can't hear it. And I hope to meet everyone tomorrow online for the first panel. Let me check. That's European time, 6 p.m., Central European time, 6 p.m. And uh, the program can be found, you can still enlist on our newly launched Security History Network platform site. So thank you all. Have a good night. Congratulations Bye. on the Security History Network.